Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, first of all, I would like to praise and thank the Lord for this special occasion to celebrate our 50th anniversary, wedding anniversary. Thank you, Pastor Dan, for your sermon. Uh, we would like to thank our sons and daughter-in-laws, uh, Paul and Helen, uh, Henry and Susie, and Jim and Santa, for this celebration. Thank you for all of you, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, to take the time for joining with us to thank the Lord as Christian and I may stay together for 50 years. <laughs> Friends in Christ, I don't know how to begin with to tell you about our marriage. You know, someone said, hey Joseph, your experience, your story is important to share how you and Christine are able to get together for 50 years. Let me ask you a question, uh, folks. Would you really like to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, it's thanks. <laughs> Let me tell you folks, the difficulty with marriage is that we fall in love with a personality and must live with a character. <laughs> I recall my wedding vows that I would love Christine and uh, cherish Christine for better or for worse, for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, until death. I even said, I committed myself to provide for all her needs for the rest of my life. But folks, listen. Are you listening? <laughs> but the vows were quickly becoming mere ceremonial words and her needs were obviously becoming secondary to mine. I'm sorry, Christine. <laughs> we had spent time together since we got married. We had been employed in the same pharmacy for 10 years, and I was her boss. <laughs> I was appointed as head assistant. We are, both of our, our assistant pharmacists. <coughs> then I switched to Bob Davies American Pharmaceutical Company in Indonesia at the time as a supervisor to promote uh, the products to doctors for five years. Then we had been employed in the same bank for 14 years. I was appointed as a bank manager and Christine worked for me. <laughs> How can I become Christine's subordinate? <laughs> when we moved to Oakley, Christine is the boss at kitchen. <laughs> a good cook for the hundred homeless people. 
Now I work for Christy. <laughs> How do I work for her? To do the dishes. <laughs> so we work together to build unity in our marriage, serving God by serving the homeless people. We have joined with Rudy in downtown San Francisco every week, every Sunday evening. And every fourth Sunday of the month, I join with uh, Bob and Chara in Antioch. It's Bob and Chara <laughs> for the homeless people. You know, I've read uh, in Proverbs 22, verse 9, it is written, He who is generous will be blessed for he gives some of his food to the poor. It is love God and love others. Folks, let me tell you, there are ups and downs in our marriage. We have communication problems. <laughs> Blaming words, critical words, sarcastic words, complaining words, and condemning words. Sometimes we argue. You know, what did we argue? About trivial things. You know what trivial means? Disagreements, you know, sometimes I give a harsh answer. Even so, I have memorized Proverbs 15, verse 1. It says, <laughs> a gentle answer comes to me but a harsh word stir up anger. So she got mad. <laughs> Even in uh, Philippians, Philippians 2, verse 14, you know, it says, Do everything without complaining or arguing. <laughs> then, Christine's retorted answer. Hey, Joseph, are you a Christian? <laughs> She knows exactly that I am a graduate of a seminary in LA, in America, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, day and night, she knows exactly that I sit before the pages of the Bible, but complaining and arguing. And then I said, how good are your opinion? And everyone's entitled to his or her opinion. That's our, our common expression. It is used to refer to refer the, to matter of taste, belief, and judgment. So it's pointless to argue about matters of taste. You know, my eyesight is getting worse. And uh, Christy becomes, always becomes my guide while I'm taking the wheel. <laughs> right then. Okay. Right then again. Okay. Left turn. Okay. But then, it seems she gave me the wrong direction. <laughs> so I started to argue. 
<laughs> but listen, friends, Christine blamed me why I agree and follow her direction when I knew it was wrong. You know, folks, Christine has tried to change my emotion to be like hers. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, Christine, listen carefully. My thoughts are not your thoughts. <laughs> no two humans are alike. Each has a special perspective a unique way of perceiving the world. <coughs> Men and women lack understanding about the general differences between men and women. Now listen, friends. Most marital difficulties center around one fact. Men and women are totally different. <laughs> Let me tell you, folks, the differences, emotional, mental, or fit and physical, are so extreme that without a concentrated effort to understand it, it is nearly impossible to have a happy marriage. Do you agree? Yes. Oh, yes. I admit in front of you that my Christianity doesn't work. What a joy it is to sit before the pages of the Bible and let the Spirit reveal God's truth. But I have not followed the Bible very well. That's the truth. Friends, may I ask you one question? What is the statement your life makes? Now listen. Why do men think the things they think and do the things they do? and say the things they say. Why? Think about that. Now let me tell you, each one of us has a life view. For most of us, our life view results more from where we were born, who our parents were, and what schools we attended, then a careful examination of issues. Yet, our life view influences every thought we have, and every word we speak, and every action we take. I have so difficulty accepting Chris, uh, correction from Christine. I'll never change. <laughs> hey, Christine, don't try to change me and don't tell me where I need to change. <laughs> don't you think you are exaggerating? <laughs> I refuse to listen to my wife's correction. I'm sorry, Christine. <laughs> Hi, Christine. You have reversed what the Bible says. What is it? Husband.
Husbands, submit to your wives. <laughs> Husband, love your wife. Is that what you mean? If I always obey your instructions, we will end up in a ditch. <laughs> Uncompromising. I'm sorry. So please don't lecture me. Don't criticize me. Please. You know Dale Carnegie. Who has ever read about Dale Carnegie? Ah, good. Thank you. You know Dale Carnegie said. Listen carefully. It's very important for each one of us to learn by heart. Criticism is futile because it puts a man on the on the it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous because it wounds a person's precious pride and hurts his sense of importance and arouses resentment. Oh, please remember that, Christine. <laughs> but one thing I realize, and I'm certain, I admit that I'm not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect father either. And I'm not a perfect father-in-law either. Now listen, this is very important for each one of us to listen carefully. No one agrees to be criticized. What do you think? Let me repeat. No one agrees to be criticized regardless of how much truth lies behind the criticism. <laughs> Sometimes we misunderstood each other. Friendly question can be taken as a criticism and immediately went on the defense. There is no patented safety device that will protect us of one of life's most common collision that is misunderstanding. Someone misjudges our motives or misreads our actions and it can take days, months, even years to repair the damage. I've explored verses of misunderstanding in the Bible. Let me illustrate examples from scripture. Joseph grew up in a family knotted with misunderstanding. Joseph spent two years in prison. Why? Because of a misunderstanding. Saul construed David's success as an attempt to take the throne. And David spent 12 years in caves, always on the move, eluding the pointed spears of Saul's mistaken jealousy. Now, listen. Our Lord Jesus Christ was misunderstood <coughs> By the Pharisees, the Sabbath was made, was made for men and not men for the Sabbath by his own people, you know, the religious fanatics, and by the scribes. Oh, he is possessed by Beelzebub. And don't forget it, by his own family. They were convinced that Jesus had lost his mind. Perhaps 
You have heard the story of the two porcupines freezing in the winter cold. You know what porcupines is? Right? Shivering from the frigid air, the two porcupines move closer together to share body heat and warmth. But then, their sharp spines and quills break each other painfully and they move apart. Victims one more, once more of the bitter cold around them. Soon they feel they must come together once more or freeze to death. But their quills cause too much pain and they part again. Now listen, family members suffer from the cold of isolation too. And they learn of the pain being close to someone with quills. We desperately need to learn how to live with the bugs. There are parts of coming together in oneness. <coughs> Friends in Christ, allow me to ask one question. On a scale of one to five, how would you rate the level of intimacy in your marriage? How? I've read a book that mentions unity around the person of Jesus Christ should be maintained. Stop arguing with other Christians or complaining about people and conditions within the church and let the world see Christ. My professor used to say, now listen, it's very important. My professor used to say, forgiveness may break a cycle of retaliation and lead to mutual reconciliation and will free you of a heavy load of bitterness, <coughs> returning good for evil, returning soft answer for sharp criticism, being polite when we receive rudeness, being understood when we are confronted with ignorance and stupidity. Now, folks, folks, let me tell you the truth. These sayings are easier read than obeyed. It's much easier to study God's law and tell others to obey them than to put them into practice. Amen. What do you think? I've quoted from uh, a book, uh, Moments Together with, uh, for Couples, about uh, taming the dragon. Let me ask you a question. Where can we find the dragon? <laughs> what do you think? Where can you find the dragon? Well, let me tell you. The dragon in our dangers. The tongue, our tongue. It is, it can truly be deadly. Reckless words, pierced like a sword. But, there is a but. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. It is not what you say, but how you say it. Oh, it's very important. Let me repeat. It is not what you say, but how you say it. How easy 
How easy it is to sing the hymns during worship service. Then, listen, then after the service, get into the family cars and argue and fight all the way home. <laughs> On the other hand, when that dragon, quote unquote, is under the power of the Holy Spirit, when we are daily training to be submitted to Christ's control and available for its use and purposes, He can transform it into a, an instrument that delivers encouragement. You will find God will use you to be a blessing and encouragement to others. I was not a successful husband. I realized that for years I had been unaware of many my wife's emotional needs. For years, she had to put up with a husband whose callousness and indifference forced her to suffer through day after day, not having her deepest needs lovingly satisfied. I am extremely grateful for all that I have learned in the past. I was too domineering of her. I realized that my wife, Christine, is a special person who needs tender treatment. After receiving Christ as my personal Savior and Lord, my eyes have been opened. A thoughtful consideration of various conclusions and actions. And I see my wife, Christine, as the unique, beautiful individual that she really is. I'm devoting the rest of my life to becoming the husband she deserves. Since I fail to understand their basic differences between the natures of men and women, and Christian and I need to listen to your advice from each one of you how to experience an ideal, peaceful, and fulfilling marriage from God's view. We need to learn from you, all of you, how to become a perfect husband and a perfect wife, a perfect parent and a perfect parents-in-law and a perfect parents' grandparents. You know, I've read a book written by Florence Littor, explained. When we know who we are and why we act the way we do, we can begin to understand our inner selves, improve our personality, and learn to get along with others. As we have just renewed our vows, I apologize to Christine for ignoring her correction. And my new year, Resolution is <laughs> to put the Word of God into practice, especially in Ephesians 4, verse 32, and Colossians 3, verse 13, that says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, Forgive, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Bear with each other, 
and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Our friends in Christ, we need your prayer support. Pray to God that the Lord will permit Christine and I to have more years together before we start our walk through eternity together. Thank you and God bless you.